Keep it 100. That's one of your least favorite <laughs> phrases. Right. Least favorite phrases. Anybody? You can't do that. Okay. Least favorite phrases. I don't feel like it. Okay. Least favorite phrases. It is what it is. Okay. At the end of the day. Right. Okay. That's that one. At the end of the day. That ain't no use. Okay. That's that one. Do what? Do what you want. You got to say it like that. You're right. Car? <laughs> Carmen likes to go play. That's probably not a new car. Let's quit. Let's quit. Okay, let's not quit. But let's quit. That's the way I am. What did you say, Chad? Quit. That's it. Quit. Good for you. That's the least favorite. You don't like that phrase? Good for you. Okay, 
I was going to. Okay, I was thinking about that. I was going to. Okay. I'm with you in spirit. No. <laughs> Anybody? Better you than me. Better you than me. Okay. So mine is as well a lost generation. That's just a lost generation. That's just a lost generation. <laughs> Least favorite phrase. You know those things that say negative. None of us are comforted by the negativity around us. None of us are comforted by those negative messages about what we can't do or it is what it is or that's a lost generation. Our text this morning, both of them really, all three of them when you put them all together, remind us, the people of God, that we always, always have something to look forward to. We always have a reason to smile. We always can know that there is a better day coming, that troubles don't last always, that we can may endure for the night, but joy does come in the morning. Yes, Good Friday is a reality, but Sunday morning is coming. Because of Jesus Christ, because of his passion, we have been delivered, and we are destined to rejoice. In other words, because of how good God is, and has been to us, we can't help but rejoice in the presence of the Lord. Because God has been so good to us, because God has delivered us, because God has spared us, because God has given us another chance every now and then, some of us just want to say thank you and celebrate in the presence of God. Every now and then, because of the goodness of God in our lives, we just might shed a tear of joy. We just might wave our hand. We just might stomp our foot because we know that we have been delivered and we are destined to celebrate, to rejoice in spite of what goes on. Recently, I visited with an individual who was having trouble realizing, feeling, or even believing in the liquid. I completely understand the person's perspective. There are life issues going on. The person is overwhelmed by all the stuff that they have to deal with every day. And they're just not handling it well at all. It's working on his nerve in spite of how much they're trying to Sometimes, when you are in the thick of an experience, you can't see your limitations. Sometimes, when it looks like your back is up against the wall, it's hard to see your deliverance. Sometimes, when the pains of your body step it up a notch, it's hard to see deliverance. Sometimes, when the spouse doesn't act right, when the children act up. When the pains are real, when friends veil, it's hard to see a difficult. You can find yourself in a dark and a difficult place. There's another horrible example of darkness and abusive relationships in the city of Boston. A police officer is seen slapping, kicking, and cursing out. So here we are again. I don't know what happened prior to what we see in the media, but something happened. But whatever it was, whatever was said, whatever was done, the officer went off on the shot. And it just doesn't look good. It doesn't feel good. Not justifying anything that the officer or the child did. It was wrong. It was unprofessional. It was not becoming, but all of our youth, not including some of our youth in our community, do not know, have not been taught how to respect the authority around them. And not respecting the authority around can cause dangerous and unfortunate reaction. I am not justifying the officer's behavior. I am saying that as a society, on both ends of the spectrum, we've got
got a job to do in teaching each other how to respect one another. I want you to imagine with me the utter devastation that this officer must feel as a result of his actions and social media because it's all over. He has to be in a difficult state. He has to be in a desperate state. And perhaps the child as well. Do you know a little bit of his story, the officer? Have you ever been in a situation or a space that just seemed impossible to get out from under? Have you ever said something and immediately you hate that you said what you said, but it's out there now? Have you ever reacted to someone in a way that was too harsh that it was done? The man and his child are in a difficult garden, what appears to be hopeless space. And that's exactly where we meet the people of this world today. They're in a dark place, a desperate state. The prognosis was not promised. The storm did not appear to be letting up. The rays of sunshine were not being seen or felt. And Isaiah shows up on the scene. And Isaiah says, on that day, on that day, he's speaking futuristically. He's speaking as if there is more to the story. On that day, in other words, that's not the end of the story. The trouble. It's not the end of the story. The setback is not the end of the story. The crisis is not the end of the story. The traffic jam is not the end of the story. The sickness is not the end of the story. Upon that day, a better day is coming. On that day is the word of hope. On that day means that the day of darkness will pass. On that day means that what he's going through is not going to last. Forever. On that day, means my eyes will be open to the plan and the will of God. On that day, points to hope in spite of dark and depressing reality. Isaiah, in spite of the current state of a faith, knew that deliverance already belonged to the people of God. This morning, our gospel lesson portrays a very familiar story of a man who found himself in a dark place. And yet, in the midst of the darkness, he realized, the text that he came to himself, he realized that deliverance belonged to him. Consider with me why this man is in the condition that he is in. He, in a sense, had disrespected his father. When he asked his father for the inheritance, he was, for all practical purposes, writing his father off. When did he get the inheritance? When the father died. So he's considering him as dead. Give me this now. He had an entitlement conflict. You know what they were talking about that as well. He thought he was entitled to have it now on his own terms. He was bold. He dared to ask his living, hard-working father to give him something or nothing. So we can understand why the older brother was not happy to see this party going on. The younger brother had fragrance, irresponsibly wasted all of his money that his father had given him that he did not deserve. But he had some hope in his father's house. He, in his despair, believed that he could go home. He believed that there is some kind of deliverance even for him at home. He's not asking for sonship anymore. He's not asking for equal status with his brother who stayed. He simply wants to get in the door. He simply wants to be acknowledged as a hired hand. He simply wants a roof over his head. He simply wants some food to eat. He has a belief that somewhere down in this heart that suggests a form of deliverance exists even for him. It's imperative. It's necessary for our future 
that we believe and teach that God has already delivered us. Yes, yes. Help us. The passion of Jesus. The Lenten season, the Christian walk, is about knowing that our deliverance, our salvation, our total cleansing, our new identity, our new life, our new walk, our new way of thinking and behaving has already been accomplished through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. During the early days of the Civil Rights Movement, folk who were thought of as unintelligent, poor, second class, Less than a person sang a song. They sang a lot of songs, right? But one of the songs that they sang was, Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Keep on walking, keep on talking, marching on to the freedom land. In spite of jail time, in spite of calls, in spite of challenges, they knew that they were already delivered. In this text, I really declare that God has every right to be angry with us. You don't have to tell me why, but you know how you have failed God. I know how I have failed God. You don't have to tell me, but you know when you have not done what you should have done. Yes. We know, don't we? Why God would be, should be, or could be angry with us. We, like the prodigal son, have wasted some of the blessings that God has showered upon us. We, like the prodigal son, have taken the blessings that God has given to us and wasted them on our own selfish wants. And yet, God has delivered us. And yet, God forgives us. And yet, God waits patiently for us, if you will, to come to the senses that he has given to us and recognize the blessings of admitting our failures and returning to the God who created us in yes. his very own yes. wonderful image. So we too have to celebrate and rejoice. That's what the Father says to the older son who just isn't there yet. I understand that older son's point of view. Yes. He's been dutiful. He's been responsible. He sacrificed. He didn't go off on vacation. He gave his time. He invested in the family. And is this the Thanksgiving? What? A party for this brother who has been disrespectful, who has splurged and had a ball and lost everything and dares to come back for some more? What? Are you serious? I don't think so. Yes, so said the Father. This is awesome. A good change has occurred. A life has been saved. My son's life is restored. Your brother has returned. We have to celebrate and rejoice. The Father might be the prodigal one. The Father might be the one that lavishly outpours us. The Father is the one who pours out his love for his son, and he celebrates his return, we have a heavenly father mm -hmm. who lavishly loves us. You know, there may be some who don't think we deserve the heavenly father's love. There may be some standing in the door, I ain't going to celebrate with them because they ain't staying on that song because I don't want them know. There may be some Turn up their noses because God has turned up his love for you and for me. Amen. We may even find ourselves turning up our noses because God has loved those who we think aren't lovable. We may find ourselves every now and then thinking that there are those of us who do not deserve the forgiveness of God. But our God is glad to welcome the returning child and his loving, forgiving family. The good news that we celebrate again and again and again is that you and I have a home in the presence of God. We have the forgiveness of God. We come again today to this altar to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ given 
for the forgiveness of our sins. We have been delivered and we are destined to rejoice in the presence of God. We have the forgiveness of our sins. We always have leaders that are brand new every single morning. We are delivered and we are destined to celebrate because God welcomes sinners like you and me into the world. Know today that you are welcome into the forgiving presence of God. You are delivered in Christ. And because of Jesus Christ, you are destined to celebrate his power every single day of your life. Don't let anyone anybody, anything, turn you around or tell you anything different, you are delivered and destined.